Amen. I don't know, but, well, I do know. I've been blessed by the music this morning from our instrumentalist to the choir's piece just now, from Jerry and Trish's wonderful duet to the congregational singing. What a blessing it's been to be in the house of the Lord. Uh, turn, if you will, to the book of Daniel in the Old Testament, Daniel chapter 12. Uh, as you turn there, I, I've got a quick story to tell you, one you may have heard before. Uh, the former coach of the Georgia Bulldogs is a man named Mark Rick. Uh, now, he's, of course, the coach of the University of Miami now, but he is also a well-sought-after Christian speaker. A lot of people like to hear him talk about his faith that he often shares with the, the students and the athletes that he trains. Uh, with that in mind, I was blessed to hear Mark Rick speak on a couple occasions, one being at the Georgia Baptist Convention. And he gave his testimony, and, and here's in a nutshell how short it is, but what took place. Uh, years ago when he was the assistant coach to uh, Bobby Bowden, uh, who was also quite sought, sought after as a Christian speaker, he, he recalls a time when one of the students, one of the athletes passed away and the coach Bowden called the entire team together coaches the team members called them all together not only to give them the information of what had occurred but he gave them the gospel presentation and here's how coach Bowden concluded his presentation he said if that boy had been you would you be in heaven or hell right now. Mark Rick said that was the day he received Jesus as his Lord and Savior. You know, often uh, we are confronted with the cold hard fact that we are created to live for eternity. And because we are created to live for eternity, we will either end up in hell or we'll end up in heaven. So with that being said, you and I are going to talk over the next couple weeks about heaven and hell. Daniel chapter 12, I want to read three verses, verses 1 through 3. The topic for this week's as well as next week's message is eternity, a matter of life or death. Daniel chapter 12 beginning in verse 1. At that time Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation. Even to that time, and at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust or of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting cont contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn uh, many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, again, we praise you for the reading of your perfect word. We're thankful, Lord God, for the presence of your spirit. And we pray right now that you'll speak to our hearts and to our minds. Lord, I pray for the anointing of your spirit upon me right now as I preach your precious word. And Lord, I pray for the anointing of your spirit uh, upon each and every person who is present. That they will hear your word and that your word by your spirit will change their lives today. We love you. We praise you. And it is in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. In the earlier days, you've often heard the preaching of God's word was, could be pretty fiery at times. In fact, there were messages known as fire and brimstone sermons. At that time, what the pastor would preach is uh, strictly on hell. He would preach on damnation. And in doing so, there was an intent in his voice and in his mind to possibly scare people out of hell and into heaven. That's not necessarily a bad thing because I don't know about you, but if hell is that bad, then perhaps it ought to be preached about. But over the recent years, I would say quite a few years, things have changed in our congregations. Things have changed in our churches. You see, we've cartoonized Satan. 
We fictionalized Satan. We've turned him into something of a character. We've got people who sing about uh, eternity, some would say, sing about things that really aren't what they are about hell. The absolute truth is simply this. There is a hell. There is a heaven. The question that each of us must ask is where will we be for all eternity? I mentioned earlier that uh, this is a two-part message, meaning I'll begin this Sunday morning, but I won't end until next Sunday morning. Now, you don't have to t stay for the whole seven days. You can just come back on Sunday morning next week and get the end of the story, so to speak. But this week, I want to uh, talk to you about hell, and next week, I'm going to talk to you about heaven, both subjects that are so important in our uh, life. This morning, we're going to begin with a topic of hell. The title, or should I say part one of this message, is simply this, the warning of eternal separation. The warning of eternal separation. In other words, hell. What else are you going to uh, call being separated from an almighty God for all eternity but a place called hell? hell. God, since God is creator and sustainer of all, separation from him is loss of all. Since God is all that is holy, separation from him is all that is wicked. Since God himself is all that is good, then listen, separation from God is all that is uh, bad. Since God is all that is right in this world, then separation for all eternity from God is all that is wrong. This is a warning of of eternal separation. Really, it's a biblical caution to all that we are to call upon the name of Jesus that we can avoid this eternal place called hell. Now, it's with that in mind, I want to share with you four factors about hell this morning. Here's the first factor. I want us to look at the reality of hell. I mentioned a moment ago that we've cartoonized Satan. We've made jokes about Satan to the point where Satan is nothing but a joke. And that's the way the world sees it. But listen, sometimes that's the way the church sees uh, Satan and sees hell. But the reality of hell is different. I mentioned there are some who sing, some who write songs, or some who write poems about hell. And let me tell you, what they have to say is wrong. One songwriter in his chorus wrote, I'd rather laugh with the sinners than cry with the saints. Sinners are much more fun. Only the good die young. If you think about it, in our TV programming, there's a show called Lucifer. It's obviously about Satan, Lucifer. But Lucifer in this uh, uh, television network on, I believe it's on Fox, is, is really an okay guy. He's just one of the many sons of God. And although he's mischievous, he's really out just to better himself. No wonder we have a misconception of Satan. No wonder we have a misconception of what hell really is. We have to understand the reality of hell. In many of our churches, we are seeker uh, friendly and we refuse to preach on hell. There are many churches that are pseudo Christian and they don't believe there is a hell at all. But the reality of hell tells us differently. I want to share with you two things that I believe will help us to come to the conclusion about the reality of hell. Here's the first one. First of all, hell is assured in scripture. Now let me warn you right now, if you're not used to hearing the word hell, you're going to hear it a lot this morning. Hell is insured in scripture. Let me ask this question of all of us. Do you believe in the word of God? Now, first of all, if you say no, there's only two answers, no or yes. If you say, I believe in most of the word of God, what you're saying is no. Because you're picking and choosing in God's word what you believe is going to be accurate. In other words, you are attempting to be God and you're going to pick what is eternally true. So you're either a no or a yes. If you say no, I do not believe in the word of God, then you have much more problems than and trying to figure out whether hell is real or not. In fact, you're probably on the road to that same destination. 
But if you say, yes, I believe in the word of God, then listen, you have no alternative but to believe in the very reality of hell because hell assures us or is assured in scripture. You know, there are many who believe that hell is uh, metaphorical. But how on earth can you read the word of God and say it's metaphorical when it is actually literally mentioned and literally expressed in the word of God in the same passages where it talks about heaven? In fact, in the passage before us this morning, it says some, some to everlasting life, some to shame and eternal uh, contempt. Now listen, I don't know of very many Christians who would walk around and say, well, heaven's not real. Heaven is just more of a metaphorical concept. It's an idea. It kind of motivates us. But listen, if we're going to believe there's a heaven, we have no other alternative but to believe there's a place called hell. In the New Testament, 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4, the Word of God talks about, uh, it tells us about hell. It says, for if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. Listen, hell is not metaphorical. When you turn to uh, uh, the book of Matthew and you find Jesus telling the, uh, the parable of the tares and the, uh, and, and the wheat and, and how the good seed is sowed alongside with the bad seed, he tells us that in the end times, the Son of Man will send out his angels to gather both, uh, both, and then the tares, listen, the tares, it says, will be cast into the furnace of fire, and there'll be wailing and gnashing of teeth. And in contrast, in that same passage, it says, and the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their fathers. You cannot say one is metaphorical and the other is literal. Listen, that's the reality of hell. Hell is assured in Scripture. When we look at that Word of God, here's another factor we should take into consideration. Hell is affirmed by the Savior. In other words, we must consider what Jesus has to say about hell. I mentioned a moment ago, uh, uh, chapter 13 and, and uh, the parable of the tares and the wheat where Jesus talks about the literal hell. In fact, I would venture to say that throughout all the Old Testament, throughout all the New Testament, the, the character in the Bible, in God's word, that talks more about hell than any other writer or biblical character is the person of Jesus Christ. He continues to talk, in, uh, talk about hell in Matthew chapter 5 as well as chapter 7 in the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 10 verse 28, he tells this to the believers, and do not fear those who kill the body and cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both the body, and, uh, the soul and the body in hell. In Matthew chapter 23 verse 15, Jesus denounced the Pharisees and the scribes who he says, travel the land and seek to win one proselyte. And when he is one, you make him twice as much the son of hell as yourselves. And then in verse 33 of that same chapter, Jesus says this to them, serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? That's the reality of hell. It is affirmed by the Savior himself. If one accepts the authority of Scripture as being inspired, inerrant, infallible, and accurate, then it is absolutely clear hell is real. It is assured in Scripture, and it is affirmed, affirmed by the Savior, the reality of hell. Now here's the second factor. Not only do we find here the reality of hell, but what about the residents in hell? In other words, why was hell created? For who was hell created? There are two primary truths I would add to that in order to find out who are the residents of hell. Number one, hell is created for the wicked. It, how, how do we know it's created for the wicked? In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 31, after God had created all things, he stood back and he looked at what he had created and he said it was very good. Let me just tell you, there's nothing good and there's nothing very good about hell. And because sin entered through man and through demons, because sin entered this world, there's now wickedness in this world. It came by a matter of choice of created being. And because it is hell, there is a hell for the wicked. Hell is created for 
the wicked. I read a moment ago the doom of the false teachers in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4. It read like this. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned and cast them down into hell and delivered them in chains of darkness to be reserved for the judgment, he goes on to say, how much the more will he do it for those who uh, falsely uh, teach? In the book of Jude, verse 6, it says this, And the angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their abode, he reserved in a place of ever, or he reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for judgment of that great day. In the book of Revelation, chapter 19, we read about the coming of the Lord, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. In verse 20 of, of Revelation, chapter 19, it says this, Then the beast was captured. And with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. And the two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. Satan as he is bound for a hundred or for a thousand years during the millennial rule of Christ. The word of God tells us as well. Revelation 20 and verse 10. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. And they are to be tormented day and night forever and ever. Jesus simply put it this way, Matthew 25 and verse 41. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you curse, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Hell is created for the wicked. But let me share with you another truth. Hell is the consequence of choice. The word of God says, Hall of sin and fall short of the glory of God. Uh, condemnation is ours. In John chapter 3, verses 17 through 18, listen to what the word of God says. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. Hell is a consequence of choice. Listen, we chose in two ways. We choose to sin and then we choose not to believe upon Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Because of choice, hell is there, and they become a residence. In John chapter 3, verse 19. And this is the con uh, condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. No one is sent to hell, but many will be cast into hell because of their choice not to place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Hell is created for the wicked. Hell is a consequence of choice. These are the residents of hell. So we've looked at the residents of hell. We've examined quickly the reality of hell. Here's the third factor I want us to see about hell, and that is the reflection on hell. Uh, what Daniel alludes to by writing the following, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt, is a reminder to all of us that we are, that, that we are destined for eternity. And we're not just talking about some spiritual euphora. We're talking about physically being resurrected. Not just some, but everybody will be physically resurrected. In fact, uh, in Revelation, chapter 20 verses 11 through 15 we have what is known as the great white th uh, judgment, uh, throne of judgment. In fact why don't you go ahead and turn there now. Book of Revelations chapter 20 and I want to read just a few verses beginning in verse 11. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 11. The word of God says thusly then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which are written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged. Each 
each one according to their works. Listen, those who are raised on that dead are, are day are those who died without Christ. Well, how on earth do you know that those that were present died without Christ? Well, very simple. They were judged for salvific meaning, uh, salvific worth, their works. As Christians, our works do not save us. It is not our works, but the saving grace of God through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary that saves our sorry soul. And those who are raised on that day are those who are dead without Christ. And there's but one verdict that will be given to them. And that is the verdict of guilty because their name will not be found in the Lamb's book of life. Now listen to verse 14 and 15. It goes on to say, then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You know, if we want to have a proper reflection on hell, I believe we ought to take a closer look at those two terms given in those last two verses. So let's see what they describe for us. First of all, two things. Number one, hell is described as a lake of fire. Now, I don't understand how a lake could be on fire. Now, I do know there are chemicals that float on top of fire that can be lit, that continue to be lit for long periods of time. I understand that chemically. Uh, but I don't understand and I cannot fully explain to your benefit uh, how that is going to be pictured. How can fire burn for all eternity? How can men and women suffer in fire for all eternity and, and not pass and perish? I, I, don't, I can't explain it, but the Bible teaches it. Hell is described as a lake of fire. So let me share a few thoughts that perhaps may or may not clear up some misperceptions. Number one, hell is a place of punishment, not persecution. You do understand there's a difference. You see, when we attempt to say persecution, what we're really saying is, God, it's really your fault. But it's not God who chose to go to this place called hell, this lake of fire. We choose it of our own will. It is a place of punishment, not persecution. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 30, we read, And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Paul, referring to God's final judgment in, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 9, These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Hell is a place of punishment, not persecution. Secondly, hell is a place of retribution, not rehabilitation. Let me say that again. Hell is a place of retribution, not rehabilitation. Now, please understand, I, I do know that retribution is uh, synonymous with punishment. You can just interchange those two words. But the key here is eternal retribution, eternal punishment. If something is eternal, then there's nothing to look forward after it's been judged upon you. And the word of God says it is eternal judgment, eternal fire, eternal punishment, not rehabilitation. I hate to say that, but if you believe in purgatory, you believe in an unbiblical concept. In other words, you're not going to work your way out of purgatory and end up in a thousand years or a million years in a place called heaven. Listen, the, the judgment is final and the judgment is eternal. In Matthew chapter 25 and verse 46 Jesus concludes and these will go away listen to everlasting punishment but the righteous to eternal life let me just point out again you cannot read a verse like that and tell somebody with a, a with with truth on your face and, and believe it in your heart that part of that refers to a metaphorical hell and the other part is a literal heaven no it is eternal punishment and eternal life Hell is a place of retribution, not rehabilitation. Thirdly, hell is a place of separation, not subjugation. Let me say that again. Hell is a place of separation, not subjugation. Contrary to popular belief, Satan will not be in charge of himself, much less in charge of anyone else. 
Hell is not a place where Satan is going to gather his horde and train them. Satan will be too busy suffering for all eternity. He will not be subjugated. To be subjugated means to be subject to. Listen, those in hell will not have to, oh, well, I guess I have to be subject to Satan for the rest of eternity. Oh, no, he'll be suffering, and so will the person in hell. In Ma- uh, I, I mentioned before, well, let me just read it. In 2 Thessalonians, sometimes you just lose your place, right? In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9, it says, There shall be punishment with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord, that separation from an almighty God and from the glory of his power. Separation from him is uh, the lack of governance. God, who is supreme governance, will be separated. And so in hell, there will be absolutely no governance, no subjugation, no person in charge, just eternal suffering. Hell is described as a lake of fire. Here's the second thing. Hell is described as the second death. Uh, This description of hell ought to remind us of two things. Number one, it ought to remind us that all of us will be resurrected one day. I mentioned that earlier. Not just spiritually, but physically, we'll all be resurrected. If we return to our source document, that being Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2, we read, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting uh, content. Uh, or contempt. Some will use this passage often to, to point to passages like this and other passages to talk about how there will be no rapture of the church. But that's not what this passage is speaking on. What this passage is speaking on is, number one, we're all eternal, every one of us. And there are two eternal destinations, heaven and hell. And people, all people will end up at one location or the other. Hell is described as a second death. In Revelation chapter 20, verses 12 and 13, it describes the resurrection of the dead and it does not include those who died in Christ. How do we know that? It says, and I saw the dead, small, great, standing before God and the books were open. The sea uh, gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades get, deliver up their dead who were in there. They were judged, each one according to their works. We understand in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 that all believers are going to be judged according to their works, but our judgment according to our works will be determined our rewards as they're passed through the refiner fire that which which holds true we will be rewarded that which is burned up that just goes away but the passage here is talking about those who are dead without Christ rising again and one day they'll be judged by the works why are they going to be judged by the works because their name is not found in the Lamb's book of life they'll be judged by the works because no one works can, can, no individual's works can get them out of the, the fiery depths of hell we're saved by the cross of Calvary and that alone no wonder the writer of Hebrews 9 27 reminds us and is appointed for men to die once but after this the judgment then why is this called the second death well what else are you going to call eternal condemnation what else are you going to call life You can't even call it life, existing forever, suffering in the pit of hell. What an appropriate title, second death for all eternity. Here's another thought I I believe we should think about uh, as it deals with this description. Uh, Because all of us are resurrected, it ought to remind us all that we are indeed eternal beings, created to be in a relationship with God. Uh, You understand what happened. Sin. We're separated from God. But God provided a way for that separation to go away in the blood of Jesus Christ. That's a reflection on hell. And I don't know about you, but it sure doesn't sound very good. Just in those two simple descriptions, the lake of fire, the second death. What a reflection. There's a third thing I want to, or fourth thing I want to share with you, a fourth factor of hell. In fact, it's not really a factor of hell. 
It's actually the remedy against hell. In other words, the remedy against hell is the invitation. It's what we come to at the end of a service and we call upon people who have not yet placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ to do at the very moment. To avoid hell, to implement the remedy against hell. Daniel gives us that remedy in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. He says, and at, the, at that time your people shall be delivered. And then listen how he defines those people who are going to be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book. It mirrors that of what we read about in the great white throne where it says, and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The remedy against hell is to have your name written in the Lamb's book of life. And the question that must come to our minds is how do I know my name is written in the Lamb's book of life? Well, that's the gospel story, isn't it? In fact, let me share with you four quick steps. You can do it in three, I guess. You could do it in one because they all really take place simultaneously. But first of all, recognize that God loves you. You know, in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8, the word of God says, Ha uh, atheist gape esten. God is love. And the manner to which that is written, the perfect tense, the perfect future tense to that which that is written tells us that God is love continuously and his love never stops. But it means even more than that. It means that God is love and that's the very nature of God, the character of God. That means all of the other attributes of God still fall under the fact that God is love. Yes, God is love, but God is perfectly just and in his justice he still loved in his wrath God is still love God is love but listen John 3 or John 3 16 makes it clear that he's taken his love and he's loved you and he's loved me for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life God loves you Billy Graham used to say at practically every conclusion to his great crusades, he used to make that fact known. He would stand there at the end and, and he'd tell them, if you forget everything that we talked about today, remember God loves you. So recognize that God loves you. Secondly, recognize that you're a sinner. How easy is that? Look in the mirror. There's a reminder. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We often think of that passage and we say, oh yeah, I remember when I was that once. Oh no, you still are. But recognize you're a sinner. The problem is that it's that sin that separates us from God. How do we get back from it's God? Well, recognize that you cannot save yourself. This is step number three. Recognize that you cannot save yourself, but God sent his son to save us. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his love in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Recognize that you cannot save yourself, but God sent his son to save us. So then you can take the fourth step. And that is receive the forgiveness of God and the gift of eternal life. You know, there's a difference between recognizing something and receiving something. Even when it comes to a gift, Every Christmas, as we pile up the Christmas trees underneath the Christmas, our Christmas presents underneath the Christmas tree, we look at our tree and we recognize those are our presents. And some of them I say, that particularly is mine because it says my name on it and it's from my wife. We can recognize the presents, but we still haven't received them. We can sit down, if I don't know what your family uh, uh, traditions are, you can sit down and presents can be handed out and they're getting piled up. And guess what? You have those presents. You know they're yours. They're now sitting in front of you ready to be open. But you still only recognized the presents. You haven't received them. You have not received those presents until you open them, until you embrace them. 
till you make use of them. We can recognize Jesus all we want, but we have to receive him as our Lord and our Savior. That's the final step. When you and I receive the forgiveness of God, that means we've repented from our sins. When we receive the gift of eternal salvation, that means we've received Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Repent and receive. Believe and receive Jesus. And your name will be written in the Lamb's book of life. And you would have solved the dilemma, the remedy against hell. Jesus said this in Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. That's the invitation. Jesus has called upon you. Won't you avoid hell for him? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do praise you. We thank you for the power of, the, of your word, your spirit. Lord, uh, it's not my intention just to scare people into heaven because we know that's an impossibility. But perhaps being a little afraid is a good thing as it draws us to ask the question and to answer, what will we do with Jesus? It's my prayer that everybody that's here today would have already taken the step to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. But Lord God, there may be someone here who hasn't, who hasn't taken that step forward to receive your son. And perhaps this is the time you'd call them to do so. Lord, perhaps there's someone who has not followed in obedience to your word and your will through baptism as they make their public profession of faith. Perhaps you'll call them to do so this morning. But Lord, many of us present are followers of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And perhaps we need to know and to understand and to recognize the reality of hell even more. Realizing that there are lost people all around us whose destiny is just that, hell. Perhaps that will prompt us, motivate us, encourage us, and compel us to go out into the highways and byways to share the gospel message with others. Lord, whatever decisions are upon the hearts of your people, I pray that you will work within them to respond to your will. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.